Greetings, and welcome back to the Rose Bros Podcast. This episode, we are joined by Mr. Anthony Marino, President and Chief Executive Officer of Tenaz Energy. Tenaz Energy is a publicly listed energy company traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange with a market cap of approximately $65 million. Tenaz has domestic operations in Canada, along with offshore gas assets located in the Netherlands. Mr. Anthony Marino is former president and CEO of Vermilion Energy, Baytex Energy, and Dominion Exploration Canada, with additional management and technical experience with AEC, Santa Fe Snyder, and Plains and Atlantic Richfield. Mr. Marino holds a Bachelor of Science in Petroleum Engineering from the University of Kansas, an MBA from California State University, and is a Chartered Financial Analyst designation holder. In addition, Mr. Marino is a non-independent director on the board of Tenaz Energy. Among other things, we sat down and discussed growing the Tenaz recap share price by approximately 30%, reducing costs of capital, and how to spot mispriced assets. Enjoy. This podcast episode is sponsored by Conate Water Solutions. Do you need cost-effective water sourcing options to supply your next drilling or completions program? Conate Water Solutions is a specialized hydrogeology company focused on water well drilling, testing, and water management services in Western Canada and Texas. Contact info at conatewater.com or check out conatewater.com for more details. This podcast episode is sponsored by EcoFlex Recycled Rubber Solutions. EcoFlex has been providing the oil and gas industry with matting and safety walkways for 30 years, with mats that are resilient, flexible, and an eco-friendly option for your toughest site conditions. With shock absorption, insulation, and easy maintenance, EcoFlex mats are the perfect choice for any job. Check out EcoFlex.com for more details. Well, if you're ready, we can start. Tony Marino, good morning. Thank you very much for doing this. Good morning, Trevor. I'm very happy to be here with you. I know you're busy and your time is valuable, so I really appreciate it. It's it's my pleasure. For the listener, you are the CEO of Tenaz Energy. What is Tenaz Energy? To start from the top. Tenaz Energy is a newly founded ENP as of a couple of years ago. We're publicly traded. Symbol is TNZ on the TSX. The name Tenas means tenacity in Spanish. We use as our logo uh, a shark, and uh, that's another symbol of tenacity. I guess the concept there being that we're going to be tenacious in our pursuit of value for shareholders and particularly uh, executing this model that we have of making what we think are undervalued acquisitions, primarily in the overseas market, and then uh, subsequently we hope and we believe doing a better job of developing the properties. We are founded by a group of energy professionals, really uh, primarily technical people that have worked together for a couple of decades, most of us, in uh, several different companies historically, Dominion, Canada, Baytex, and Vermilion. We created this particular vehicle that trades on the TSX, TNZ, uh, by recapitalizing an existing TSX venture company called Altura Energy uh, in uh, the latter part of 2021. Altura was a, a small company with a very good Canadian asset, uh, what I would call a semi-development, a, a semi-conventional development project south of Edmonton. And if you like, we can come back later and talk about what we mean by uh, semi-conventional. And Altura uh, had been publicly traded in that incarnation for about six years uh, before we came on the scene. We talked to the CEO of Altura at that time, uh, uh, David Burkhardt, whom we had worked with at uh, Vermilion. He had run our French unit there and then uh, moved on to create Altura and the Altura board about changing the strategy of the company, continuing with the Canadian development because we thought that was a really good development project that Altura had started and then uh, really primarily shifting the company to a strategy of acquiring assets overseas where we felt that the entry valuations were lower, that the opportunity for subsequent operating performance uh, improvement was greater than we could find in the domestic market. We, along with uh, uh, the management uh, infusion of capital, along with a number of institutional investors, and we made some available for retail investment as well, injected around $30 million dollars into Altura in late 21. We paid off the debt in the company uh, 
Uh, a few months later, we migrated the new company, Tanaz Energy, to the TSX Big Board, and that's where we uh, trade today as TNZ. Uh, you know, we just continued the development of the Canadian asset, put it back on a growth trajectory. Uh, we made an initial deal overseas in the Netherlands. We're working on more transactions that we think will add value for the existing owners. The uh, uh, Tanaz team, I mentioned, had been together really uh, all or in part for about a 20-year plus period, actually. So a bunch of people that uh, I wouldn't say were exactly like-minded. We disagree on a number of things, and we have a quite a active debate within the company about uh, what to do. But uh, we're like-minded in the sense that we share the same objective and I think a uh, a real emphasis on on creating real value for the shareholders. We're uh, super focused on technical excellence in the company. For us, in an acquisition model, uh, that starts with accurate evaluation of the properties. This is, uh, I think, about half the battle in acquisitions is uh, making sure that you properly uh, evaluate the property. There's always going to be a great deal of commodity risk in everything that we do. We can control that to some degree, obviously not all the time, and uh, we, we have to live with some component of that, and that's part of the reason that people invest in our company. But what our goal is with that technical capability in this uh, acquisition model in evaluating these properties is to take the controllable risk out of the process. Uh, we don't want to uh, blow it on the technical evaluation, get something wrong that is foreseeable ahead of time. Uh, we want to know what we think the, the properties are capable of doing and then implement where we have control of the assets, implement that once, uh, you know, once we close the deal. And again, going back to the commodity risk to the extent possible, control it, but making sure that if there is a foreseeable risk, a controllable risk, our technical evaluation takes that out of the uh, equation. So that's really the the basis under which the uh, company was was founded. We're a small group of people, even with uh, you know companies today about two point three exercise it was when we started a year and a half ago. Uh, but even with that, we're still a, a small group. I think around fourteen people in the company. I've said this on the podcast before, Tom McKinnis from Spark Capital, the least fragile leaders are the most likely to do things like this. Some CEOs are just out of my league, but it seems like a lot of the best ones are willing to do podcasts and get out there like this. So do you think of it that way in terms of getting out, really sharing your thoughts with the public? You know, I'm I'm quite happy to do it, especially I've, I've listened to some of your podcasts and you, you do them very, very effectively. They're thoughtful questions and uh, as I've listened to uh, to the ones you've done, I've it, it's made me think about the industry. I don't really consider it a risk. To me, it's just a conversation, and uh, I think it's wonderful if people think that I have something uh, worth taking the time to listen to, and I'm I'm super happy to do it. For example, I think your phone number is on the website. <laughs> That's uh, uncommon with the uh, traditional energy or any CEO, really. Well, uh, you know, we we're a small company. There's no question about it. So. Uh, it's kind of a uh, you get the kind of personalized service here, I guess, for that reason. I, I think I I think I did the same thing at previous uh, two companies. Uh, prior to that, it was Dominion, part of a Canadian uh, sub of a very large U.S. entity. But uh, always have put that number out there, and I'm not afraid to accept calls. <clears throat> they could be from any one of our stakeholders. I would say, particularly if they're from our shareholders, we want to hear from them. And this is uh, this is one of the things I've really liked about the public companies and, uh, you know, being in the leadership of the public companies, these are the people that we work for. And uh, these are the people that take the risk with us with their money, with their capital, uh, their savings, you know, that uh, presumably this uh, hard -earned, hard earned money that they, uh, they depend on for the long term, for me or for the rest of our executive group to uh, make ourselves available to those shareholders is, uh, it's kind of a no brainer. I mean, it's the right thing to do. And I enjoy talking with them because, they have uh, varied perspectives, and they have very good perspectives. I mean, these are, the, by definition, they're important perspectives if if these are the people that we work for. These are the people that own the company. You've had good jobs before in the past. You're the CEO of Vermillion, which is a great job that most people would aspire to. You're, so why start Tenaz Energy now? Did you see the opportunity at this time, or what motivated you to go on hard mode in the energy <laughs> market? Well, uh, none of those jobs, uh, whether it was CEO at Vermilion, CEO at Baytex, or even running the uh, CEO of the Canadian unit of Dominion, none of them were 
probably particularly easy jobs. I mean, I enjoyed all of them. I probably would have done them for free just because it was such a, every one of them was such a challenge and so interesting. So I was happy to do them. You know, when I started my career, I worked for a big company, Atlantic Richfield, Arco, in the United States, uh, ultimately bought by BP. And then a set of U.S. independents. I worked for Plains Resources. I worked for Santa Fe, Santa Fe Snyder, uh, as it ultimately became in the U.S., I worked for AEC, the old Alberta Energy Corp that became in Canada, ultimately, uh, in Denver. Then I, I worked for Dominion Resources at the time, Dominion Energy now uh, renamed. I uh, had a very large E&P company. They're a huge U.S. and, and quite successful uh, utility. And then Baytex Vermillion, now Tanaz. So Atlantic Richfield or Arco was a major I think uh, when we started, we had when I started there, we had fifty thousand employees. The other ones were all intermediate sized publics, and I quite enjoyed it. And there, there's a certain beauty in the intermediates, in that you know uh, you've got a small company feel typically with them. It varies a little bit, but there's still some division of labor. And it's not like in a startup you find uh, the very small number of people that you start with. We had maybe five at the beginning. People that, again, we'd worked together for a long time at these previous companies. But that group of people has to find a way to do everything. The IT, you know, the uh, outfitting of an office, uh, any HR aspects of the company, all of this infrastructure that uh, in a, even in an intermediate company is size company is taken care of. So in that sense, I mean, well, probably in most senses, probably every one of them just about as challenging as those intermediate jobs, uh, size jobs were, the uh, startup, it definitely is more difficult. There, There is no doubt about it. However, I went through all this uh, set of companies previously in my career, and I always had this interest in uh, having a, a successful startup. Uh, part of it might have been just a question, you know, uh, can we uh, uh, be successful in starting a new entity from scratch we felt we probably could. We were going to do everything we possibly could to make that successful. And now, uh, you know, we're now we're at the stage of finding out. We've had some success so far, and we think that we're set up to have more in the future. I can see the size of the company and the um, uh, kind of the energy level in the company continuing to build. We haven't uh, really established all that specialization that you have in the inter intermediate size company yet. You know, we're. 2,300 barrels uh, right now, still pretty small market cap on the order of uh, 65 or $70 million. Stock is up, I don't know, 25 or uh, I think some 30% maybe since the recap. So it's been, I think, successful for the original investors during that time. It went way up, went way down. Now it's uh, up about 30% from the recap level. Of course, we want to do better over time. But, uh, you know, we're, we're still in the early stages of proving that we can do it but I think we're off to a good start and I think we're I think we're well set up to uh, continuing that we like being a small company and even in those intermediates the goal was always to make them operate more like a small company trying to simplify them down even as they grew in size trying to simplify it down in terms of how people worked in the company uh, to make it feel as much like a small company as possible uh, be as efficient as a small company uh, typically is or has to be. Uh, you know, for us, we're uh, we're definitely at that small stage. I think we're pretty efficient internally. Very little bureaucracy, no politics in the company. Uh, these are things that make it more fun to work at, and they also make the company more efficient. We're, I think, in the process of proving that that can be translated to a bigger company size. The objective is not in and of itself to have a big company, but to some degree, that is necessary. You need it for operating economies for the long term to cut your unit costs and maximize your margins. And you need it in, as a public company to get that capital market scale to make the company uh, relevant for a broader range of investors. That's why we want to get to the bigger size. But as we do that, we want to maintain to the fullest extent that is possible this small company feel and this small company way of operating. Skinning the game. Did you have to invest your own money? The best entrepreneurs put their own money in the company or was it more of an investment of your time? No, we definitely put our own money into the company at the time of the recapitalization. Uh, every one of the uh, officers of the company participated in in that. 
So, uh, and that's only the right thing to do. First of all, I, it's it's the right thing to do because we should all always be there with the same risks and reward profile. I think that the uh, an outside investor uh, in the company has somebody who's not an insider in the company. Eat your own cooking. Uh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it is, I think, a good investment from our own perspective because. While we still are exposed to the ups and downs of commodity price, and that is the dominant feature in this industry, the volatility of the product that we uh, produce, it, I think that uh, for, for me personally, and I, I, I know the rest of the management team shares this philosophy, we feel like we've got a better chance to make positive returns if we have an entity that we have some control over. Yes, we're subject to the changes in commodity price, but at least we can control within that volatile uh, economic environment, we can control what the company does with our decisions, how ef efficient we are uh, internally, how effective we are in deploying capital, what sets of opportunities that we can identify, you know, how we go about, like I was talking about at the beginning, how we go about evaluating that set of opportunities when it comes to, uh, to new acquisitions. We've got control over every one of those items. We have confidence in our experience and our capabilities uh, in doing this. And therefore, we think it gives us um, a better chance than if we just invested in a broad swath of the public market, whether it was in energy or uh, uh, just in the overall economy that's available in the in the public market. From the perspective of capital allocation, today is May 26, 2023. In your opinion, what is the best way forward for Tenaz? In terms of investment, is it pure growth? Is it paying a dividend, returning capital shareholders? Uh, from your perspective, where do we go from here? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, in, in kind of relating that bio uh, within the industry, I saw a variety of models employed and try to, of course, take the best uh, from from each of those companies as we uh, as we have the, the new venture here. Um, uh, what I did learn, uh, beginning with the income trust here, and actually it really it really started with uh, – Dominion Canada. Uh, we are a small part of this bigger uh, overall utility uh, in the United States. And, uh, you know, our charge was really to uh, provide a free cash to the to the corporate parent. The unit uh, at the time was probably on the way down in production. And uh, we did reverse that to uh, have a, uh, a flat profile in the company while shifting from a real free cash flow negative position to free cash flow positive position. So that was a time where we, where I first saw the value of returning cash to the owners of the company, in that case, a corporate parent. Then <clears throat> moving to Baytex, when I, when I joined, it was an income trust and of course, very oriented toward uh, distributions to the uh, unit holders. I definitely recognized in that entity how desirable, how effective in the cat in the public markets, just how it was the right thing to do to return capital to the owners of the company. There's so many good things you can say about that. I, I think in the way most people think of it, it reduces risk because it kind of grinds down your effective basis uh, that you have from your original investment. It definitely forces when properly run, that model definitely forces the management of the company to be efficient in the way it uses the uh, the uh, employees' capital, because you simply don't have the full cash flow stream available to reinvest. A portion of it is dedicated to the owners of the company, and, and that's the right thing to do. It leads to better capital efficiency, forces it really. You got a pretty good reception in the in the capital markets, no question about that. <clears throat> and of course, Vermilion uh, was a dividend paying corp after the. Uh, when I was at Baytex, we converted to a corp as a result of the uh, law change in 2006 on trusts. And then uh, when I went to Vermilion, it was a uh, dividend-paying corp. So I definitely believe in the return of capital for the reasons that I talked about. I think it's especially effective when it can be combined with very strong technical work to improve the capital efficiency, basically the investment returns of the company. There's various ways to implement a return of capital model. You can have continuous growth in dividends. That was sort of the previous style that uh, uh, you know we attempted to uh, use pretty successfully, I would say, coming out of the income trust uh, era. You could have a variable dividend. A number of companies have turned to this, I think, recognizing the volatility uh, that exists in the, in the industry. 
and certainly uh, in the future, I think there could be merit in that approach. It doesn't always have to be a dividend that starts at a certain level and builds over time. Those dividends can get to be unsustainable potentially when you're we have a, a price downturn. And of course, another way of doing this is is via share buybacks. Today at Tenaz, we're a very small company. We do generate free cash uh, from our uh, base operations. In addition to having you know this capital that we brought in at the time of the recap, we do intend to increase the the cash balance, the negative net debt position of the company over time. But even we at our small size do employ a, a buyback. It's not a huge one. We probably today retired something like 4% of the shares that we had at the time of the uh, recapitalization. I'm quite sure we're in a pretty positive position in terms of the value of that investment that the company has made in its own shares. Specifically, we brought it in originally. The This buyback is kind of a cleanup trade given that Especially when we started, we were a fairly low liquidity issue, and we just needed some way on certain days, really, to clear the market. So we put an automatic plan in place to uh, retire a small number of shares. It maxes out at 6,000 shares a day right now. But it was, uh, I think, effective for that purpose at the time that we put it in. And, and we do consider the, the shares a, a very good investment. That's our assessment of it. The company's got quite a high NAV. I mean, the year-end NAV was something like 5 Canadian per share. Current trading price, I think, is around well, when we started, maybe it's two thirty-seven per share, or something like that. So, if we use that measure as one of many, you know, we think it's a pretty inexpensive issue and it's good investment by the company to buy back those shares. So, at present, at our small size, that is the way that we're uh, returning that capital to owners. And again, it had the variety of purposes: good investment, clean up trade, return uh, uh, another way of returning really capital to the owners of the company. You know, I, I do like dividends. I think that that income component uh, has, in my experience, it has great value to investors for the reasons that we started with in the discussion earlier. I think at our small size today, it doesn't behoove us to put a dividend in place. We're developing the Canadian asset with free cash where, as it grows. We've got a uh, free cash generating asset in the Netherlands but we'd like to add to the size of the company. And it's some, you know, we'll do a combination of deals, we believe, over time, a combination of small ones and larger ones. But I think we'd like to get to a bigger size before we establish a dividend. That, I think, would be the most, just practically, that's the most efficient way for us to go about it in the capital market. But over time, we would intend to return both through buyback and through through uh, dividends. Another thing to to kind of go back to that history and and re- that I had in career earlier, and then relate it back to what we intend to do in in Tenaz, uh, starting with just stabilizing Dominion Canada and then turning it from negative free cash and declining to stable and and returning free cash to the parent, and then at Baytex, which which was already in a in two thousand four was already in a income trust income distribution model. They're just through, I think, good identification of projects, substantially improved capital efficiency in the company. We were able to pay that distribution and, in fact, increase it over time and at the same time provide a pretty good growth component to the company. Uh, Learn the same thing at, that the same thing could be achieved at Vermillion. So the what we really want to have is a company that grows while it's generating free cash that can then be deployed in buybacks, in dividends at some point in the future or just adding to the uh, balance sheet of the company in in terms of negative net debt, in terms of positive networking capital position or positive cash, while we're doing that with organic growth in the company. And in our case, as we did in the past, adding to that with accretive acquisitions, value-adding acquisitions. In this company, starting at the very small level, really the primary objective of the company is to make acquisitions that have high rates of return, throw off free cash, are accretive for existing owners, and then uh, fit them into the this capital markets model of returning capital to the owners. So uh, there, that's going to be the main source of growth that we have. We do have the existing organic growth asset from starting from a small level. And when we make significant acquisitions, they are typically going to be designed to be able to provide an organic growth component out of the assets we acquire at the same time that they are throwing off free cash. Warren Buffett would say buybacks make sense when the market value is less than intrinsic value. When you're calculating the buybacks, trying to figure out intrinsic value of the company per share, 
how do you do that? If you were to put your finger on two or three aspects of that calculation, is it reserves, is it cash flow, is it the intangibles? What goes into that calculation? Well, it'd be it'd be primarily the the tangible ones, although the intangible component I think is something we're aware of as well. Good management. And, <laughs> well, we're going to do our best for sure. We've got an experienced set of people that are uh, very motivated and uh, very incentivized to. Uh, to try to provide value to the company, and that's uh, that is an important intangible factor. We don't intend to stay at this size, and it's not our objective to stay at this share price for the for the medium to long long term. But really, it would be primarily the tangible factors, and I think they definitely apply in our case. We're in kind of that definitely the small cap at this point. I'd say micro cap end of the uh, public company spectrum, and these issues often do not trade at very high multiples. I am kind of used to uh, being able to build up the multiple in the publicly traded companies, and we in- do intend to do that here. And and we did actually on the recap, the recap at a dollar eighty, we had a ten for one reverse split. It was actually at eighteen cents, and then I think of it as a dollar eighty uh, recap with the uh, reverse split. We actually built up to a pretty high multiple in today's world when uh, over the initial trading period of the. Uh, of the new Tenaz uh, stock, we did get I think three seventy or something like that a share. We did subsequently trade lower, even below the recap price, and now we built it back to this uh, two thirty seven or so uh, in the market. For us, though, at uh, all of these levels, we we feel like it's trading below intrinsic value. I mean, one measure you could use is the independent reserve report, which has at year end it has on the order of a a five dollar per share. Uh, 2P uh, ATAX value, NPV 10. Uh, so that's one measure that suggests that there's pretty good space between where we trade and what uh, the company might be worth. We trade at pretty low multiples, I would say, of everything, uh, cash flow, production, free cash, uh, all, all of these, especially when you do it on an EV basis and take off that negative net debt in the company. At Q1, it was about $19 million and uh, something we intend to build over time. So, yeah, on all these tangible measures, we definitely uh, would consider it to be a good investment for the company to uh, buy back its stock. And it has those other advantages we talked about earlier about kind of cleaning up uh, the trade, uh, especially when we were lower liquidity uh, or early in our, our uh, Tenaz history. Good companies get rewarded with a, be a lower cost of capital. It's easy to maybe say what a good energy company is, but from your perspective, what makes a bad energy company and punishes the company with a poor cost of capital? What do you avoid? High liabilities, spending too much on acquisitions. What are the things that you try and stay away from? Well, I mean, you you identified a a couple on the list right there. I mean, uh, acquisitions, sometimes in the history of the industry, some of these companies have not been able to do them very effectively. And I'm definitely value oriented in the investments that we make and uh, any investment even I would make for my uh, uh, personal account it's it's quite a value orientation so we we do want to make deals at low multiples at very high implied rates of return based on a reasonable price deck you could use the strip or something below the strip uh, to make that assessment you know where we're Getting IRRs on the really dependable reserve categories, PDP, approved, developed, non-producing, not very much attribution typically to undeveloped uh, locations, although we'd certainly evaluate that. We do want to make good value deals. And, and getting back to your question about what have been the problems in the industry leading to low valuations for certain companies, you know, I think uh, one of the problems has been making acquisitions at way too high of prices. We like to make them at low multiples. What's very important is uh, to us is a high IRR expected at the time that we make the deal. And, of course, those uh, realized IRRs can get better with higher prices. They can become a lot worse with lower prices. But if you create a bunch of margin uh, with your initial entry price, uh, low multiples, uh, high IRR, you've got a lot more room, of course, uh, if commodity prices disappoint, as they uh, do at least half the time, I'd say. So that has been one issue. Uh, excessive debt uh, certainly is an issue. In our current company, we're in a negative net debt position. You know, I do think that there can be, uh, the, the whole industry has definitely delevered. In kind of stable times in the industry, if they ever exist, you, you can run with a certain degree of leverage, but it should be pretty modest. And the acceptable, just in my career in the last 20 years in the public markets, the acceptable level of uh, leverage has definitely decreased. I mean, 
20 years ago when I when I started in the income trust sector you you could find 4x uh, debt acceptable 3x debt acceptable and there's just no way a company would uh, run with that today uh you know we're not probably in a commodity super cycle like people uh perceived at that time an acceptable level of debt probably is uh below one turn today i would say uh uh, we, and again, we we elect to run, in fact, with a negative net debt. So that's that's been an issue, uh, I think, uh, for companies. Just internal poor capital efficiencies, I think, do become apparent to the market over time. This would be illustrated, uh, you know, you've got independent reserve reports for almost all these companies, for all the intermediates and smaller. Typically, they're what we called engineered reports. Uh, meaning that the third-party firm, and there are several good ones in Canada that uh, do this, several good ones in the United States. Our engineering firm is McDaniel at Tenaz. These are good external reports. Some of the bigger companies would only use audited reports. But in any case, from those third-party reports, you can derive things like recycle ratios, uh, I think, uh, pretty reliably. It would become apparent to the market, I think, if the company's internal capital efficiencies were were very poor via those uh, reports and if they were way off their guidance uh, over time. That is uh, something that the markets would not be tolerant of. Companies need to hit or exceed the, the guidance that they're establishing for the public market to have that reliability. These are the things that would lead to, among a number of them, that would lead to lower valuations, I think, for uh, companies in the industry. And all that said, too, just like the turns of debt we talked about earlier, just no question about it, the uh, equity multiples have compressed dramatically in the in the industry. And, you know, I, I don't think we're very likely to return to these levels that, you know, the very uh, high returning companies, the outperforming companies at that time could get to. And it was great to uh, enjoyed some of those 11 and 12 and 10 and 9 multiples that we we're able to build up the previous uh, entities too, but I don't know how realistic that would be for, uh, uh, you know, really for any company to get to today. The idea is to buy mispriced assets in the market for maybe pennies on the dollar, one, two times cash flow to create value for shareholders. The problem is that there are a lot of eyes on the market and when mispriced opportunities come up, it's hard to get them at the right price. In your experience, have you found a certain catalyst to provide the opportunities for you? For instance, like a black swan COVID event, or is it distress management teams? What's the best way to find those mispriced assets? That's another great question. And the, the most basic answer to it is that given that uh, we have such up and down cycles in this industry and you can't rely on being at a, a COVID point with negative or very low pricing, those events exist. We'll come back to that maybe in just a second uh, regarding timing. But in a down cycle, you're in the middle of the cycle, you're in the, an up cycle. Oftentimes, you don't recognize uh, where you're at in the cycle because uh, these uh, commodities do surprise, especially uh, oil and gas, I would say. So the, the key, I think, is very disciplined, very consistent, and very accurate technical evaluation Technical insights. Exactly. Uh, anytime you're acquiring, it should be a well-by-well -well evaluation of what exists in the current well stock. It should be a project-by-project -project evaluation of what you can do with them to the extent that you can identify it in the uh, evaluation phase, whether it's workovers or development drilling. We don't put a great deal of uh, emphasis or plan a great deal of investment in exploration, but it should be accounted for as well just uh, uh, in terms of as a potential acquirer being aware of what is out there because it might you might be able to deal it off, get some value out of it. There might be some projects that within a diversified reinvestment portfolio would be, even if their exploration would be worthy, worthy of uh, investment. So you want to identify the full range of outcomes. If you do this on a disciplined basis over and over and you use reasonable price decks, somewhat conservative to uh, evaluate them, you can make your own assessment uh, for what the property is worth. You know, you will make an offer typically that is at a very high rate of return under this evaluation. And uh, if you are able to uh, get the seller to agree to sell under these terms, it's great. It's very likely to work out for you if you're, once you close the deal. And in that other over 90% of the time, probably in the range of 95% of the time, the seller does not 
elect to sell at that price, you just go on to the next one. You take what you learn technically, you take what you learn in terms of the asset market, and you go on to evaluate the next uh, uh, asset without worrying about it, without looking back, without chasing deals. That's that's actually the best way to get uh, mispricing is to take a, a number of evaluations, ultimately make offers on them at a consistent set of criteria and a disciplined evaluation method- methodology and a conservative bent to uh, the inputs to that evaluation, including pricing. And then when you make deals, you should be okay. There's also, of course, there's an element to sourcing as well, to becoming aware of assets. Uh, and, and here it's a whole wide range of uh, media that you use to do this. You do have a dealer community, uh, banks and boutiques that uh, have insight and uh, have relationships with sellers. And for us, typically, they'd be large company sellers, international oil companies, uh, state-owned enterprises in some cases, ex-SOEs in some cases, major independents. Sometimes we deal with the smaller independents as well. So their relationships uh, can have value in calling to your attention certain assets. We have our own set of relationships with, uh, you know, really each of these types of entities. And we make those contacts. We maintain them. We inquire about certain sets of assets that we're aware of through publicly available data and our own experience and our own database that we've accumulated over time. You know, you can get some very good entries into deals via those personal contacts. You know, and even in the uh, COVID or a little bit post-COVID era, I I have found it very important to try to actually meet the people in person, not trying to do it all uh, remotely. It It is just more effective. And I think you can get more potential acquisition started when you do it that way. We've done it uh, that way throughout our careers in this team that we've assembled at Tanaz, and that's the way we're trying to go about it today. So there's a a whole lot of ways to source, and uh, you just have to stay out there in the market and make sure that these sellers are aware, potential sellers are aware of your interest, uh, and then you evaluate consistently. And and what you want to end up with, I mean, is a a negotiated transaction. Preferably, it is a completely one-on-one transaction where you have no other potential buyers that you go against. And I know it must sound surprising, but in a overseas anyway, less so I'd say in the domestic market, which is better developed in Canada and the U.S. uh, than overseas. But oftentimes in this overseas market, that is exactly the situation. They're either what we would call one-off negotiated transactions, or maybe there's one or at the most, maybe two other parties that you deal with. Of course, even here, there are exceptions. Sometimes you do have a true data room bid situation where perhaps there's four or five parties in the data room. Not all of them are going to make bids, though. Not all of them are going to be credible. So even there, hopefully you've got it down to maybe at the most one or two serious competitors. And as you do this more and more and you have a lot of contacts with the sellers and maybe if there are dealers associated with the with the transactions, you actually can get a pretty good assessment of how many companies you're dealing with. You can look at who is in that market to begin with and, and know how many you uh, potential ones you would start with. And we find over and over that usually we're going against uh, zero or one or two other parties. In terms of rate of return on acquisitions, this is very important because if it's a bid situation like you would have in North America, a seller, typically via a dealer, broadly marketing a property, a little less so today, but uh, still true to a significant degree, you could have a significant number of other parties that you are bidding against. I mean, in the kind of the old days, maybe it was 10 years ago, you might go against 10 other parties. That number today, I think, in North America would be significantly reduced. And and the other parties are today are more, these competitors are more disciplined. uh, They're more efficient to begin with. So uh, uh, they're good competitors. But it still might be four or five of them that make uh, credible bids on properties. When you have that number of competitors placing bids, essentially a sealed bid auction like it would be on crown land, let's say here, the winner often is going to, the so-called winner, the, the the successful bidder, the high bidder, is often going to have trouble making a high rate of return on that property. They make a higher bid because maybe that's their technical assessment of the property. Maybe they are using a higher price deck. Maybe they're using a lower discount rate or what they think is a lower cost of capital that they have. Any of these factors uh, 
and all of them together uh, particularly could lead them to make a higher bid on the property. But bidding theory, and this has been vindicated by empirical analysis, and it's, I think, vindicated by anecdotal experience, when you have a lot of bidders, and I, I think you can see this intuitively, the probability of a successful bidder, the high bidder, making a good return on that property is way lower. So throughout the cycle, the ups, ups and downs of the cycle, it's very important to be in situations where you go against very few other bidders. Sometimes they're unloved properties. I get that. We don't particularly shy away from that because every property has a value. If it's unloved for no good reason, we'll make a fairly low bid and expect to make a high rate of return on it. If it's unloved for a good reason, we might not bid at all or we might bid at a very low value. You could have negative values on certain properties and you could make a very strong transaction out of it that's very good for the uh, the buyer, for the owners of our company, for example. It's all about value and being consistent in it. And it's very much about going against a small number of bidders, especially if you're extremely value-oriented buyer like we would be. I don't want to say we're a bottom fisher. I don't like that term, really. We're just consistent in the demands for rate of return that we have and in the evaluation methodology, technical and uh, price-based. So back to the timing aspect of this that you mentioned at the beginning, use COVID as a good example. I mean, yeah, COVID was a quite extraordinary time, right? Uh, you know, for the world at large, but particularly uh, I, I think of it in terms of our industry. Operating during COVID, uh, especially the beginning phases of it, was quite a a challenge. Capital markets impacts were huge, and everybody is aware of the negative pricing that we had for oil on the for WTI on a single day, and uh, extremely low pricing kind of that we had in that April, May, maybe June time frame of uh, 2020. Of course, you'd want to take advantage of that if feasible to buy it at the absolute trough, find a seller in distress, and they did exist at that time, no question about it. And a few companies that were ideally positioned with with cash and no debt in particular were able to identify sellers that had to get off assets at that time. And there there were even in Canada notable deals that occurred exactly, at least were established in that time frame. Some of them closed later on, but good deals were made by uh, perceptive buyers. The challenge in that, of course, is hitting it at exactly the right timing with financing available, team in place. That's not always uh, as feasible. You know, the issue with the particular COVID downturn was uh, sort of its sharpness, depth, and brevity, you know, the shortness of that cycle. And of course, <clears throat> you had the big rebound out of COVID, which was, uh, especially in hindsight, but even at the time was pretty predictable. These prices can't uh, last. We've got declining production in this commodity. There has to be reinvestment to uh, stabilize supply. Even if it's oversupplied with low demand for a brief period, you know that you knew that demand would recover at some point and that uh, supply would be behind because of the very low price period and the low capital reinvestment. Kind of an issue the, the world has, I think, with energy supply to contend with for the long term as well. So you, you could tell that coming out of COVID, you'd, had a, you'd have a rebound, but it was exacerbated. It was so much uh, more pronounced as a result of having the war kick in after that uh, towards towards the end of 21 you know the portents of war began to affect pricing and of course once the uh once the war started in in early 22 you know you were in uh, kind of full bloom on that uh, pricing response it would have been strong enough just having the rebound from covid but the war intensified that and uh that kind of uh, super high price spike is not very conducive to making acquisitions, especially when you have uh, an offering philosophy like we have that is based on a pretty conservative set of assumptions going in. Technically, uh, demand for high rate of return and uh, an unwillingness to use those kind of peak prices as the basis for valuing properties. So that that huge rebound, kind of in our case, caused a delay in making additional uh, in, in making those first uh, transactions. And I, I much prefer a a market like today that has relatively stable prices, oil and uh, gas are not at uh, super high levels. Probably a prospect, I think, for better prices looking forward, given the, given the uh, continuing chronic underinvestment that you have in the industry. We're not going to forecast that when we're making an evaluation and an offer, but uh, we're 
I think there's a decent chance of achieving that over uh, over the next few years. Maybe a simple heuristic would be smart technical analysis with disciplined capital allocation, sort of like a Mike Rose at Tourmaline or a Neil Rizzo at Headwater. He told me the story of buying the Clearwater assets in the middle of COVID. He was trying to do deals at that time. And that was, I guess, what makes them, that separates good management teams. Yeah. yeah. You know, actually those are excellent examples and those are two super strong uh, performing companies and sets of teams over and over and over again. So there's clearly capability in, uh, uh, that they an added value that they bring to it. My, I admire them. My hat is off to them. And I, I listened to that interview, that podcast that you did with Neil Roselle. There is an example of perfect, not only preparation that they had with their team, having done this type of thing over and over, recognizing the potential in, in the clear water and um, a type of development with the unfracked horizontals that I love. You know, I think it's uh, super effective in that type of rock. We were doing we we're actually the leader in that at Baytex uh, at Seal originally, and then were able to expand it to other places. So, you know, he was perfectly prepared to do that, and he hit it at the right time, and he executed on it. There is an example of doing it, doing it at the right time, as well as uh, uh, doing it right on a day in day out basis for a long period of time. Uh, Murray Edwards bought the oil sands assets in 1999. Do you remember that? Oh, for sure. CNRL is a great example of this at a at a very large scale. It's it's hard to do with the large companies, but CNRL has continued to add value and it's made those counter cyclical investments and uh I mean just created such a a unique franchise in in western Canada. Currently the energy sector is undervalued. A lot of journalists and investors don't want to invest in the industry for a variety of reasons. In your opinion what will it take to get investors back? <laughs> yeah, that's a a great question. The public markets, the capital markets uh not just public private too probably. Uh they They've been unwilling to invest uh, for a good reason, and that's that they've been burned by this industry so much over a long period of time. I mean, part of it is that the a lot of this money tends to come in at the peaks in the in the sector. You know, in our previous discussion about the post COVID and the post war run up in price, that opportunity maybe to invest at the peaks wasn't that great for them because it was just so it was just such a compressed, uh, exaggerated cycle. But typically in the past, that money has come in later in the cycle when uh, prices were peaking and uh, valuations were peaking. Uh, and, and furthermore, uh, until about the last, oh, I don't know, eight years, I would say, I don't think there was adequate capital efficiency on a technical basis really being applied by the industry. And, and so for all those reasons, it just provided a bad return over decades so it's understandable, really, that they uh, haven't wanted to invest in it. Furthermore, you know, during that whole time for the public markets, there has been uh, a whole trend toward passive investment, toward indexing, or the ones that aren't indexed or closet indexers. Even the ones that are active tend to be momentum, much more momentum-based, computer uh, algorithms uh, directing the investment rather than really human-directed fundamental evaluation. And of course, Moving so much in that direction sets up probably the next opportunity for alpha and for uh, active investing to be successful. Uh, but for all these reasons, poor returns, indexing and with a, a downward cycle in the proportion of the indexes that were in energy, there just wasn't as much need or as much interest in in having uh, specialists in this sector. So they'd be there is not the large number of institutions that are willing to make active investment via specialists, analysts, and, and PMs in energy. There aren't very many dedicated energy funds. They don't have nearly the AUM that they used to have. And this is all just part of the description of the problem or a description of the conditions that we have today and the reasons behind it. If the question is, what does it take to uh, bring them back in and then, by the way, there were many other factors in it. The kind of the ESG distaste for the industry doesn't have to be that way. I think the companies today are very effective in their energy efficiency, in their emphasis, and their actual implementation of critical ESG values and projects. I think they're very good at it. The Canadian industry is great at it, actually, and I think still doesn't get enough credit for what it does in this regard in the oil sands and other areas. Same thing, actually, for the U.S. industry. But in any case, that was a factor as well that drove some investors away from oil and gas, didn't meet their ESG criteria. 
So, uh, you know, as you look forward, what can remedy this and uh, bring investment back into the sector? You know, the first thing is uh, just like what is the cure for low oil prices? It's low oil prices. What is the cure for low energy valuations? It's low energy valuations. That brings less capital into the sector. It makes reinvestment into the commodity more difficult. It does set up a uh, probably a opportunity anyway for higher prices going forward. And that recognition that over time that there's value, recognition that there can be better top line growth, I think will naturally bring some investors back in as they seek better value opportunities compared to super high valuations that have existed in other sectors. Tech would be, high growth tech would be uh, one of the examples of that maybe. Secondly, because there's a lot more emphasis on energy security, both to have just the supply to, you know, to run modern life in these economies and because governments uh, recognize for uh, long-term economic development, it's better to have a degree of energy supplies assured. I think it makes the industry palatable to a broad range of investors. It ties back into this ESG dynamic. It makes it possible, I think, for the industry to get recognized for its very significant accomplishments in the area of ESG, carbon efficiency, energy efficiency, community emphasis um, uh, that this industry truly has, I think, compared to a lot of other ones and doesn't get credit for. So that component of the need for energy security, I think on a ties back to ESG and can make uh, the industry more palatable. And that, along with continued industry improvement in these areas, can bring in a broader num- a number of investors. Whether it happens through renewed energy specialists, kind of a regeneration of that that used to exist, that probably can be a part of it. But I think it could occur just through greater generalist acceptance and willingness to go through the effort to understand these companies and invest in the industry. And then a third element in the uh, return profile that the companies demonstrate, I think, is this willingness to return capital to investors, whether they're buybacks, it'll be reflected, I think, in the stock prices over time, or uh, directly through dividends, through the income component. That's going to go into the total return history of the industry, and that will get the notice of investors Eventually, it'll drive up probably the value of these companies, and then you get a fourth dynamic here, which would be increasing weighting in these uh, indices, which would call forth uh, passive investment and closet indexing as well. Uh, uh, with you know those investors having to put money back into energy issues, the critic would say that's a great story, and I I like the picture you're painting. But I can earn 10% in the S&P in a so-called recession in the last year, or I can go to tech and buy at the bottom of the sector, maybe double my money in a year. What would your answer be to the critic or the generalist investor that return of capital is coming? Now is the time? Well, I mean, it would be that uh, my, my basic answer to that would be that uh, if you're capable of making a reasonable identification of companies that would expect it to be successful, I'd look at these low valuations, the demonstrated return on capital efficiencies that they're able to generate, the demonstrated return of capital that they're providing today. And uh, as long as you're not uh, an investor whose prognosis is for a very short-term sunset of the industry or another collapse in prices, seems improbable to me uh, that we'd have that collapse. I mean, I do think there's kind of a, uh, a support base uh, uh, being formed for the commodities. But unless unless you have those views that uh, things are going to be impossible for the industry, I think they're going to represent good value. I mean, to make the case, why don't I just go passively into the S&P? Uh, I mean, I invest in a lot of the uh, index funds too, right? I, I totally get it, the concept there. But I don't expect to have you know positive returns from the S&P uh, every year. I don't even know if I'm going to have them over the next year. I do recognize in the S&P, and this is a bit of a problem why you want to go to some broader indices for investing as well, that these indices are dominated by a few very large companies. Some of them are great companies, and I I do buy a few individual issues that include these, uh, some of these very large tech franchises that have a very significant free cash generation. I do get that idea, but 
you know, you're really buying a very concentrate, a much more concentrated bet than you believe you're getting, I think, with some of these indices. And I don't think a return of 10% is uh, guaranteed out of them for the next year, even for the next five or 10 years, even though if you hold them for 50 years, you may, you may uh, be very likely to get that. So I just think there's a, I think there is a value proposition for these companies. Uh, they're, should be probably some effort that goes into differentiating between them with a minimal belief in the commodity, or at least that the commodity is not going to disappear, which it can't. Uh, there's just impossible for a, a very, very, very long time. Uh, and if you don't have a belief that it's going to collapse in the near term, seems again, that to me it seems improbable, then you've, you've got a very strong uh, rationale for investing in the industry. And then you got to make your pick on individual companies and Ah, you have to make a pick along your risk tolerance spectrum as well. The king of mispriced opportunities, for example, would be Warren Buffett buying, I think he owns 20% of Oxy now. Maybe example to point to in terms of the opportunity the energy sector has right now. You know what? I'm 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 happy with that example because I, clearly uh, Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway has made those types of value calls. You know, Oxy has its uh, own special characteristics that, you know, especially at certain points in the cycle would have made it, in retrospect, certainly a no-brainer, but a pretty good perspective uh, investment like that. It is a good example. What's the biggest opportunity for TAS going forward? Is it expanding into Europe, doing undervalued deals there? Do you see opportunity in the Canadian markets, maybe in the States? Yeah, for us, I mean, geographically, we have a primary emphasis. It is Europe and MENA, Middle East, North Africa, with the kind of 1A would be uh, Europe. So that is really the area that we uh, kind of recognize the most probably undervaluation in and the most uh, the greatest set of opportunities for us. And then um, a secondary emphasis for us would be the Americas. When we came out with the uh, with Tenaz and the recap, we enter, we did identify Latin America as a place we would invest, and and we do have a few uh, evaluations that we've done some ongoing in Latin America. And it can be. Uh, South America, Mexico can be included in this to a lesser extent too. We haven't emphasized that one to the degree that maybe we would have thought at the beginning. We've been so occupied with a, a large set of opportunities in Europe and secondarily MENA, but there still is, I think, opportunity in Latin America. And then there's sort of a tertiary opportunity for us that exists in North America. And again, here, 3A would be probably for us Canada because we do start with an operating base and I think perhaps a little less competitiveness in Canada than 3B, the United States. Now, a number of us uh, started our careers in the U.S., uh, even in the companies that, that I worked for previously that did acquisitions in the U.S. Even there, we were successful. We were successful in making deals at reasonable value because of this consistent methodology that we used and value orientation in it. And then we actually were able to subsequently improve the operations, I think, of every one of those entities or uh, assets that we bought. Now, kind of the difference between Canada and the U.S. as compared to these other areas, Europe, MENA, South America, is that the industry in North America, U.S. and Canada, it is certainly more efficient than it is overseas. It's been a dog-eat-dog industry for quite a while, especially for the last year, uh, the last nine years, I'd say, since the downturn started in uh, mid-14 in pricing. And companies are vastly more efficient than they were, let's say, when uh, we began to talk about when I entered the trust sector in, in 04. The, the, the companies here in Canada are very efficient. The same thing is true of the United States. So there is just no way that the same uh, percentage opportunity for improvement exists in North America than exists overseas. You can do a lot better subsequently after your acquisition uh, with the overseas assets than you can in North America. And then when you couple that with the first part of it, which is that you can make these entries, at, make these deals at lower valuations, higher implied rate of return to begin with, it's that uh, there's a double you know, set of advantages that drive you to the overseas acquisitions. All that said, though, we do evaluate. We have evaluated a number of things in Canada. Haven't made too many offers, and we did put some straw men out there that were probably vastly out of the market. But we will continue to screen here, and occasionally we'll evaluate. We're probably a little busy at the moment with everything that we're doing in our primary 
region to uh, take some of those valuations um, all the way through at the moment. But we, we've worked so much in Canada and actually in the U.S. too that we are able to screen pretty effectively. I can't rule it out for the long term that we would make a deal in North America because we know this market. We've had success in the past. Uh, it has its advantages. It's just I'd kind of – I'd say it's an area of tertiary uh, interest for us now. We like having the broad geographic remit. I mean, I think uh, sometimes people may wonder, well, isn't that a lot of areas to look at? Well, the people in the company have worked in all these areas previously. We have kind of apply a consistent set of engineering and geoscience principles to them anyway, no matter where they're located. We like having the broad geographic remit because it gives us much more exposure to screen potential acquisitions to uh, reject those that we just don't think have uh, potential on the initial screening, take other ones to a much deeper degree of analysis, some all the way through to a complete evaluation. Usually that will lead to an offer at some level, typically uh, pretty low valuations and high implied rates of return. But if we can have that broad geographic remit to screen within, we have an opportunity to uh, to make better deals because we get exposed to far more of them. So that's the reason for the the geographic expanse that uh, we're we're willing to consider. We touched on what punishes companies in terms of their cost of capital, but maybe to leave the listener, if, from your perspective, what rewards companies? What makes a good energy company? What what makes a good energy company? <laughs> Ultimately, I think it it comes down to two words: capital efficiency, and that is uh, that's because it's a capital intensive business. So. Unless uh, you can provide high returns on your invested capital, this is acquisition CapEx and reinvested development CapEx, E&D CapEx, so both M&A and E&D, that full cycle in the model that we run, that is the key. When you can provide those high rates of return represented by return on capital employed, represented by recycle ratio, and other metrics as well, implied rates of return, that is what ultimately drives uh, energy companies, to to sum it up to the most simple way of putting it. Ultimately, uh, you know, how you dispose of assets or sell a company, if that's the objective, these things matter. How you relate the company to the public markets along the way matters because you want to get full credit for what you have and what you can do and build up to a higher multiple. But it is really, uh, that's all about amplifying the fundamental results, which come down to capital efficiency because it's such a capital-intensive business. Well, that's a pretty good conversation. I think that uh, covers the waterfront for Tanaz and your thoughts on markets and opportunities. And thanks a lot. I, I really appreciate your time. Trevor, it was uh, entirely my pleasure. Thank you. Great set of questions, and uh, I enjoyed the conversation. Quick shout-out to Lane, too. Lane Redden, speaking of getting the message out. Thanks for setting this up. Appreciate it. Uh, stop there. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode. If you liked what you heard, check out rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming shows. Until next time, happy coffee drinking. <laughs> <laughs>